Building an acoustic guitar is a constant negotiation between making the instrument light enough to be resonant and easy to play, but also strong enough to not collapse from the roughly 165 pounds of tension the strings exert on the guitar. Because of this balancing act, guitar building, more formally referred to as luthiery, which personally is a word I feel like I always stumble my way through saying properly, is not very forgiving. And there are more factors to take into account than when building something like, say, a dining room table. For me, these challenges and details are what's exciting. It's the small opportunities to discover something new or put your own twist on a classic design that makes guitar building fun. Plus, once you're done with this woodworking project, you can make music with it, and that's just pretty cool. The first of these challenges is probably the most obvious. It can be pretty nerve-wracking to bend a set of sides for the first time, but when you're working with wood that's hundreds or even thousands of dollars just for the relatively small pieces that are needed, I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of pressure to not screw it up. But a bending jig like this one from Stumac, which should be available around February of 2024, makes the process much easier and you're less likely to break sides. There's currently a pre-sale waiting list for these at an introductory price of about $1,500 for the entire kit on Stumac's site. This includes the bender, the controller, two heating blankets, spring steel slats, and the cutaway attachment. I didn't use the cutaway attachment for this build, but I plan to build a small cutaway sometime next year. Probably something like an OM model. Anyways, check out how smooth these curly walnut sides came out. The trick to not having the sides get all warped and wavy, especially with figured woods, is to not use too much water and to let the wood cook for about 10 minutes and then cool to room temperature before taking it out of the bender. If you look at the body of an acoustic guitar from the side, you'll notice it's shallower at the neck than it is at the heel. Now, some folks like to pre-cut this shape into their sides before bending them, but I much prefer to bend the sides and then set them into a template that has the top and back radius cut into them. I then transfer that profile to the sides before heading over to the bandsaw to cut it out. With the sides cut to their rough taper, I now need to cut them to their length. To do this, I set each side into the body mold and I mark my cut lines. To give myself every possible advantage to make a nice straight cut with my handsaw, I cobbled together a couple of scraps to hang the guitar side off of, along with a two-in-one clamp slash straight edge to act as a guide while I make the cut. One thing I realized fairly quickly though is I definitely need to sharpen my old fret slotting saw. Nevertheless, I made the cut without too much fuss and my little clamps together saw guide worked like a charm. With the sides to their proper length and set back in the body mold, it's time to glue in the neck and heel blocks. To do this, I first put a few of the Bessie micro trigger clamps on either side of where the neck and heel blocks need to be to keep them from sliding around once they're actually glued in place. This worked out way better than I expected. I just hope I don't forget about this little hack when it comes time to build my next guitar. With a small block plane, I begin shaving down the top and back of the sides until I'm close to the line I transferred from my templates. Then I mark along the edge and sand each side to its final radius using a 40 foot radius dish for the top and a 15 foot radius dish for the back. To provide extra surface area for the top and back to be attached to, strips are glued in place along the inside edges called kerfing. Kerfing also adds a bit of rigidity to the sides and helps them to retain their shape until the top and back plates are able to be glued on. I'm using mahogany reverse style kerfing because I prefer the look of it as opposed to traditional style kerfing, but it really just comes down to personal preference. Either one is fine. Next, I make a handful of side braces from a few strips of quarter sawn mahogany and glue them in place so that they line up with the bracing pattern on the back of the guitar. These braces add a bit of additional strength and also help to mitigate cracks from forming or spreading in the sides. And here I used my micro trigger clamp hack again to keep these braces from sliding around while they're glued in place. With the rim of the guitar wrapped up, I now turn my attention to making the back and my first stop is at the bands hall to cut a few slices from this gorgeous board of Clara Walnut. Having a drum sander in the shop for tasks like this really speeds up the process. 
and it allows me to more easily control the grain pattern that's revealed than my previous method of using a router sled and double-sided tape did. I take a few passes off the edges to be glued together at the joiner before setting up a simple shooting board from a few scraps of plywood to refine the glue seam. I carefully run a long sanding block along the edges of the board until a perfectly straight edge is produced. You can also use a hand plane, but this method works just fine as well. After a few minutes of sanding, I check my results. And as you can see, this book match is ready to go into the clamps. Gluing up thin boards like this can be tricky, because if you use too much force, they'll pop up out of the clamps. So one thing you can do to prevent this is just add a couple clamps along the seam to hold things down. Off camera, I sanded the back to final thickness, drilled a set of dowel holes that'll come in handy later, and traced the outline of the guitar onto the back. So while I finish cutting this out and sanding the inside surface of the guitar, I want to take a quick minute and tell you about the sponsor of this video. Stumac has been innovating solutions for luthiers and guitar techs since 1968, and they stand behind their tools with a simple lifetime promise. So if a product breaks, wears out, or just doesn't meet your expectations, send it back for a replacement. Simple as that. I was first introduced to Stumac in 2004 during a high school apprenticeship with a local luthier. And over all these years, I've had nothing but great experiences with Stumac's products and customer support. You can check out all their products at stumac.com or just hit the link in the card above or in the description below. So back to this guitar build. With the back graph glued in, I notched it out with my router where each of the back braces will be located. And instead of a traditional paper label, I wanted to try something different. And I thought it'd be cool to make the label from a cutoff of the soundboard. So here we go. Each of the braces for the back needs to be cut from quarter sawn wood. For this guitar, I'm using spruce and radiusing them to match the radius I put on the back of the guitar sides earlier. With that done, I set the back in place on a radius dish and glue in the braces, doing my best to keep them perpendicular to the center line of the back. Before the back plate is done, each of the braces needs to be carved and sanded smooth. I remove the bulk of the material with standard bench chisels before crowning the top of the braces with a small block plane and sanding all of the edges up to 220 grit. With the back complete, I now shift my focus to cutting notches along the back rim where the braces on the back will be tucked into the sides. And don't worry, these snaggle tooth notches will be covered up in a later step. I promise. To glue the back on, I'm using Type Bond 3 because it has a little longer open time than Type Bond 2, and I really don't want to be racing against the clock during this step. To line up the back, I have two dowels in the body mold that correspond with the dowel holes in the back that I had mentioned would come in handy later. Well, it's later, and man, those dowels really came in handy. This quarter inch plywood template acts as a clamping call to help even out the pressure from all of those go bars, and it also keeps them from denning the back of the guitar. Once the glue is cured, I mask off the top rim and spray a light coat of shellac on the inside. This helps to seal the wood and gives it a little protection from humidity swings, but mainly, I just like the way it pops the grain and adds some contrast between the different woods. When it comes to picking out the wood for the top of a guitar, there are a handful of common choices. Mainly varieties of spruce are the most popular, but redwood, western red cedar, and even a few hardwoods such as koa and mahogany aren't completely unheard of. For the top of this guitar, I'm using a nice book match set of Bear Claw Sitka Spruce from Stu Mac. Sitka Spruce is one of the more common woods used for acoustic guitar tops and lends itself well to a variety of music styles. I opted for Sitka with this guitar because I felt like its creamy light color would contrast nicely against the dark walnut of the back and sides, but I guess we'll see how it turns out. Since the guitar's top is so critical to the tone production and structural integrity of the instrument, I spend a little extra time making sure that this glue seam is dead on before it goes in the clamps. Over at the shop bot, I set up to cut the rosette, sound hole, and a slightly oversized profile of the top. I'm just using double-sided tape along with a couple of dowels for alignment. And a little tip I picked up from my buddy James over at Greg Guitar is to use a roller like this one to improve the adhesion when you're working with double-sided tape. For these operations, I'm running an eighth inch down bit from Bits and Bits. I've been using their end mills for a little over a year now and have been really happy with the results. They have a wide variety to choose from, including tiny 23 thousandths end mills that are great for cutting fret slots and inlay, or even a slogan into a piece of walnut that's about to get slathered in epoxy.
Anyways, if you need some bits from Bits and Bits, you can save a bit on your order. Just type in Woodshop Mike for the coupon code and you'll save 10 bucks. Once the epoxy is cured, I head over to the bandsaw and cut a slice off the walnut that the rosette design was cut into. And since I don't really want to start this process over again, I very carefully pry the rosette free using a putty knife. By the way, any guesses who that slogan belongs to? While you mull that over, I'll get on with adding some purfling and share some tips on how to not do this the right way. Adding the center ring of purfling was the easy part, and using tight bond for this glue up was just fine, assuming that I don't glob it on like a toddler during art class. With the rosette in place and firmly seated, I trim up the excess purfling really quick so that I can throw a bunch of little clamps around the sound hole to hold the rosette in place while the glue cures. Up to this point, things are going pretty well. I could have used CA glue to get through this process a little faster, but with that approach, you run the risk of staining the spruce, and I definitely don't want that to happen. Well, here's where I would have done things differently. For the outer ring, I went with two strips of purfling, but since PVA glue has a tendency to swell wood fibers because it's water-based, that made installing both strips of purfling a bit difficult. So, next time, I'd just go the CA glue route, and before you regale me about how it can stain the spruce top, I have a trick up my sleeve that I was just too stubborn to use. A light coat of shellac will seal up the grain and prevent the CA glue from staining the wood. Then, when you sand everything down, that shellac will be removed, and you'll be left with just a nice, crisp purfling line. Off camera, I sanded the rosette flush and brought the top down to final thickness in preparation for adding the braces. I transfer the bracing pattern from this template that I cut on the CNC and then go ahead and rough out all the braces from quarter sawn spruce. The underside of all the braces will also be radius to match the radius that was added to the top edge of the guitar's sides. The first brace for the top that I work on is the main X brace. Once the half lap is cut and it's glued up, I start refining all the other braces that will be referenced off of that main X brace. As each set of braces is finished, I glue them in place at the go bar deck with the top resting on a corresponding radius template. And because I'm selectively OCD, I wipe up any excess squeeze out before the glue cures in an effort to keep the inside of the guitar nice and tidy. Until this project, I'd never used a go bar deck, but I've gotta say I really like this approach to gluing things up, especially when there are lots of parts involved. It's really a pretty simple setup. All you need is a frame with a top and bottom that are somewhat stout and parallel. Then for the bars, you can either use strips of hardwood or these fiberglass bars that Stu Mac carries. Either way, we'll get the job done. But another thing that I just think is kind of cool about a go bar deck is the patterns that are made from all the bars. It's just neat to look at. To glue down most of the braces, I'm using Type Bond 2, but since I make my bridge plates out of ebony, I like to use Type Bond 3. From what I'm told, it's a better choice for gluing oily woods that can otherwise be kind of tricky to laminate. With all the braces glued in place, I'm now ready for one of my favorite steps, and it's carving the braces. Even though they're already scalloped, they're still pretty heavy for where they ultimately need to be, and as much as I like making progress on things quickly, I enjoy the slowdown that's required for this step. Off camera, I notched the top of the sides to let in the X brace and upper transverse brace. All the other braces end up being feathered into the top just shy of the curving, so notching for those is not required. I left the spreader in place at the waist of the guitar to keep the sides flush against the body mold while the top is glued on, and don't worry, I'll be able to get that out later once everything is cured. And just like when gluing on the back, a pair of dowels accurately locates the top and keeps it from sliding around as I clamp the top to the body with a handful of go bars. Remember when I said all of those snaggle tooth notches I cut in the side would eventually get covered up? Well, here we are, now's the time. This binding router jig really makes the process easy. On my first acoustic, I cut the binding channels by hand with a purfling cutter and it took forever. But this jig from Stu Mac makes routing the binding and purfling channels not only really fast, but also super easy and accurate. Before the binding and purfling are added, the end graft has to be glued in. 
For this guitar, I'm going with a wedge design made from the same walnut I used in the rosette and trimmed on either side with strips of black, white, black purfling, and this is going to match the rest of the guitar. Once this is glued in, I carefully cut the purfling and binding to size and dry fit the pieces about 12 times before gluing them in place. For the binding on this guitar, I'm going with ebony, and I bent that to shape while using the bending jig when I already had it set up from bending the sides earlier. To glue the binding and purfling in place, I'm again going with Type Bond 3 because of its longer open time. But now, unlike earlier, when the wood swelling could cause issues because of using a water-based glue, for this process, it can actually be helpful if the wood swells a little bit because it can help to fill in any minor discrepancies that may be in the binding and purfling channels. And just a quick aside, a tape dispenser is super helpful to have for this step. With most of the details ironed out on the body, it's time to focus on making the neck. I'm going to go ahead and be completely honest. I wasn't sure what woods I wanted to make the neck out of. I could see a maple neck with walnut accents looking good, but a walnut neck with maple accents could also look amazing. So I'll just make one of each and we'll see which one looks better with the guitar. For a guitar neck, you ideally want a straight quarter sawn blank to work with. So if you're making your own neck from a single piece of wood, you want a big chunk of quarter saw material. But if you're making a laminated neck like I'm doing here, you wanna work with flat sawn stock. That way, when everything is glued up, you'll be left with a blank that's quarter sawn. If you're not sure what the difference is between quarter sawn and flat sawn lumber, it just refers to the direction of the growth rings when you're looking at the end of a board. The growth rings in a flat sawn board will be mostly flat, where the growth rings in a quarter sawn board will be mostly vertical. Some folks debate just how critical this actually is, but given that quarter sawn lumber is more stable, that's the route I'm going to go for my guitar necks. At some point, I'll likely make a jig for holding acoustic guitar neck blanks to the CNC, but for now, double-sided tape is going to do the trick. With the blank taped to the table, I get started profiling the top of the neck as well as cutting out for the truss rod slot. I'll also mill a couple of grooves for a pair of carbon fiber rods to add some more rigidity to the neck, and I'll drill two holes for some dowel pins that'll come in handy later on. Before I get all carried away and overly excited and just yank this thing off the table, I've learned to take a minute and double check that everything has actually been cut to the proper size. The last thing I want to do is try and reposition something by hand without a reference edge or dowel pin to help me line things back up. But the good news is, Everything came out great, and I'm ready to profile the back of the neck. Before carving the back of the neck on the CNC, I first need to cut away the bulk of excess material. So after I trace the side profile of the neck onto my blank, I fire up the bandsaw and get to work. Now, if I'd been thinking ahead, I would have made this blank just a few inches longer. Then I could have cut two necks from a single blank. Guess I'll have to put that on the list of things I hope I don't forget before I build my next guitar. One thing that's critical for the next operation on the CNC is for the headstock to be supported. If it's not, it'll chatter under the cutter. At a minimum, I won't get a smooth cut. But depending on how bad that vibration gets, the neck could completely come off the table and be ruined. To support the headstock, I made this wedge, and I have the neck clamped to my table saw because it's a large flat surface, which makes it an ideal place to accurately tape the wedge to the headstock. Back over at the shop bot, I lay down a few strips of double-sided tape where the next operation is programmed to run. And I go over the tape again several times with that roller I've already mentioned to make sure it has as good of a hold as possible on the MDF spoil board. To locate the neck on the CNC, I have a pair of 16th inch dowels that are about a quarter inch long, and those are going to register in some corresponding holes in both the CNC table and the neck. Even though this tape has a pretty incredible hold, and the neck will be somewhat held in place with those small dowels, I programmed the shop bot to run a little bit on the slow side and to also take shallower passes while roughing out the neck. I really don't want to see this thing come loose and get mangled up in the cutter. Since I sawed away the bulk of the excess material on the neck, there's a lot of air cutting during the initial roughing operation. All that really means for me though, is there's less mess to clean up and less wear and tear on the end mills. Before having the shop bot, I shaped all of my guitar necks by hand. 
And while I enjoyed that process, I'm not gonna lie, it sure is nice to have a neck come off the machine that only needs minor shaping and sanding before it's ready to finish. Well, if there was any doubt that the double-sided tape would be strong enough to hold the neck down, I'm no longer concerned. I was honestly worried I might crack this thing pulling it off the table. I'm really happy with how the neck carve turned out, and with that done, it's time to knock out some secondary operations. To reinforce the neck, I'll be using a couple pieces of carbon fiber in addition to a two-way adjustable truss rod. Adding carbon fiber to a neck isn't difficult, and it really beefs up the neck's rigidity. There are a few things to keep in mind when doing this though. One, you'll be well served to use epoxy when gluing it into a project. And two, you really need to scuff up the carbon fiber with something around 100 grit sandpaper, so that way the epoxy will have some texture to grab into. My go-to for this step is Total Boat High Performance Epoxy. It's easy to work with, and I've always had good results with their products. Another thing to keep in mind is to just use enough epoxy to coat the carbon fiber, and try to not let an excessive amount of epoxy get down into the groove. Epoxy doesn't squeeze out quite as easy as PVA glue does, so do yourself a favor and go on the light side. There has been a ton of work to get us to this point and a lot of the setup and playability of the guitar rides on cutting the neck joint correctly. To make things just slightly more tense, at this point, I'm only about a week away from when I'm scheduled to deliver the guitar, and this is the first time I've used this jig for cutting the neck pocket. Thankfully though, it looks like everything is right where it's supposed to be. On the opposite side of the jig, I establish the neck angle and cut the tenon where the neck and body connect. Minor fitment tweaks can be made by hand, but the bulk of the cutting of the tenon is accomplished here, and I've got to say, I'm pretty happy with the results. Off camera, I installed two threaded inserts into the tenon so that the neck and body can be bolted together. Next up, I'm going to be blending the transition area between the neck and the top of the guitar, so that way the fretboard will sit flat against the guitar's top. Technically, this will create a little bit of fall at the end of the fretboard, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, and it'll help to prevent fret buzz when it comes time to set up the guitar. With the fretboard surface of the neck sanded flat to remove any milling marks left behind from the CNC, I'm ready to glue on the fretboard. Now, it's really important to not slather glue all over the truss rod for obvious reasons, so what I do is cover it up with a thin strip of tape, and bonus points if I remember to remove the tape before the clamps go on. So remember those 16th inch dowels I used to locate the neck on the CNC? Well, they're pulling double duty because I also use them to locate and hold the fretboard in place while it's glued to the neck. Now all I have to do is cover it up with a bunch of my favorite red clamps and go grab a bite to eat while the glue cures. Since I haven't set up a fixture for the CNC to cut out headstock profiles yet, I go about this step a little different than most. First, I cut out the headstock veneer along with any inlay and then line it up on the headstock where it needs to be. I again use a pair of 16th inch dowels to keep the veneer from sliding around while it's being glued in place, and I set a 3 quarter inch thick piece of plywood on top as a clamping call. This ensures even clamping pressure as the clamps go on. Other than that, you know the drill. All the clamps that will possibly fit, plus one or two more for good measure. I bet you didn't think a Pine 4x4 was going to play any part in this project, did you? Well, stay frosty, my friends. I can't have you predicting my next moves. Anyways, I need to cut away the bulk of material from the headstock, and if I want to use the headstock veneer as a guide, I need to be able to see it. Logically, taping a 4x4 to the back of the headstock is the perfect solution. After the profile is rough cut on the bandsaw, I refine the shape on my oscillating spindle sander. Another task I still do off the CNC is drill for side dots. This is one of those times where no oopsies are allowed. To install these little side dots, I drop a tiny amount of black CA glue into the hole and then ever so carefully line up the pearl dot without also gluing my finger to the fretboard, and then I press it in place with a plastic glue spreader. One of the last things to do before we get into the home stretch of final sanding and finishing is to drill for the tuners. The tuners I've picked out for this guitar are really nice and I cannot wait to get them installed. Getting the guitar ready for the best possible finish is no quick task. After each grit, I wipe down the guitar and blow off the work surface to remove any loose grain left behind from the sandpaper and I work my way up to 400 grit.
For this guitar, I'll be going with a high gloss finish, and I want it to be super smooth. So before I get to spraying, I need to fill the grain and establish a dead flat surface. In the past, when I've used epoxy as a grain filler, I've squeegeed it on, but that requires a lot more time sanding. So this time around, I'm using a completely different technique. I'm basically spreading a thin layer of epoxy on the guitar and trying to wipe off every last bit of it. And no, these aren't blue shop towels that will leave you with an absolute mess to clean up. These are lint-free chem wipes and I have a link for the ones I used below. I'll likely apply three to four coats like this, scuff sanding between them until I'm happy with the surface. And a quick hat tip to my buddy Ty over at Shock the Fox for introducing me to this approach over the squeegee method for grain filling with epoxy. The last part to knock out on the shop bot is the bridge. I wanted to do something a little different than the standard bridge design that's slightly more than a bulbous rectangle, and this is what I came up with. I might tweak the design a bit down the road, but for now, I'm pretty happy with it. There are two ways to deal with glue surfaces under the bridge and fretboard. I prefer to mask off these areas rather than have to scrape away the finish afterward. To have a clean transition between the bridge and the top, I have made an undersized bridge and used that as a template. This will result in just the slightest amount of finish being under the perimeter of the bridge, but it's not detrimental to the strength of the glue joint. Since I don't have my explosion proof ventilation system set up in the finishing room yet, and I'm using a solvent based finish, I'll be spraying the guitar outside. The downside is the potential for bugs or dust to land in the finish. The upside is great lighting and no nasty fumes in the shop. Maybe when I wrap up my finishing room, I can also set up a better way to spray my guitars too, rather than swinging them around on a stick and praying that I don't drop it. Over the course of two days, I applied six thin coats of finish. After the first day, I level sanded everything before spraying the final three top coats. After that, I let the finish cure for 24 hours, level sanded again, and worked my way up to 1500 grit before buffing it to a high gloss. Now, if you sand in a crosshatch pattern like I'm doing here, make sure you finish off each grit by following the grain direction. This will make the scratch pattern disappear against the background of the wood grain. When gluing oily woods like ebony, especially for a critical glue joint, it's a good idea to rough up the surface with something like 80 grit sandpaper. I'm not quite as worried about glue squeezing out with this step because it will easily wipe off the finish. So I go a bit more liberal with the glue application here. To align the bridge, I'm using two eighth inch drill bits because apparently I don't have any eighth inch dowels in the shop. And I'm using Stumax bridge clamping call along with a few sound hole clamps to evenly apply pressure. Oh, and one quick tip here is to wax the dowels or drill bits. The last thing you wanna deal with now is a piece of metal sticking out of your bridge. That'd be unique for sure, but it's not gonna be quite as much fun to play. Even though this is a bolt-on neck, I still need to glue the fretboard down to the top. If I don't, I run the risk that the end of the fretboard will move around a bit during seasonal temperature changes, or that the lower frets will buzz when the guitar is played. And nobody wants that. These Waverly tuners are not only insanely smooth, but I absolutely love the open back design. The bushings with these tuners press in, so you've got to make sure the hole size in your headstock is dead on for a proper fit. The only trouble I had was keeping them from spinning around because that headstock was so slick. So I ended up laying down a few strips of painter's tape to help hold the tuners in place while I marked the screw locations with an awl. I then pre-drilled for all the mounting screws and made sure to not drill too deep with the help of a little depth gauge tape flag before putting the tuners back in place. When working with small screws, applying a bit of wax to the threads will help things go much smoother. You can use most any kind of wax really, but my go-to is standard paste wax because it's sticky and stays on small threads just a little bit better. There are a handful of small tasks left to wrap up, like making the nut and saddle, leveling and polishing the frets, and drilling out the bridge for the bridge pins. But for now, let's keep it simple so we can string it up and make a little music. While I was in Nashville, I had the opportunity to meet up with a great picker, Orrin Thornton, and he ran this guitar through the paces before I headed off to hand deliver it to the Carhartt store right on Broadway in downtown Nashville. And man, did he make this guitar sing. So if you're ever in the area, go check it out and let me know what you think. 